Let me start with a simple question first and foremost. How many of you consider yourself to be beginners in all this? Okay, most of you. How many people are all over it like flies that <coughs> Well, all those left over will be. <laughs> so we've got a bit, a bit of ground to cover. Who's heard of the Unum Sanctum? One, two, three, four. Right up here. Unum Sanctum. Okay, why is this unknown document so important? The Unum Sanctum is a document that was set up around the time of the Magna Carta. Who's heard of Magna Carta? Okay, how many of you have heard that it's the solution to all our problems to go back to the Magna Carta? That's it. Yeah, what if I told you you're wrong? <laughs> you're wrong. Okay, so what happened with the Magna Carta? A couple of barons decided that they weren't happy with all their money being taken away by the Catholic Church. So they said to uh, King John, mate, we want you to look after our interests, not after the Pope's interests. So they created the Magna Carta. And they took it to, to uh, I was going to say Saint John, Saint John, King John, and they said, sign it. He went, no. They so pulled out a knife, and they put it to his throat, and they said, sign it. So we signed it. What does that make the Magna Carta? Void. Void. Can't sign a contract under that. So the other thing about the Magna Carta was, and people cited it as being the thing for the people, is the barons weren't looking after the people's interests, they were looking after the barons' interests. Yeah. So all the barons had all these serfs and slaves on their property who weren't benefiting from it at all. So the Magna Carta's a bit of a furphy, right? So the, the Pope said, well, I'm going to rebut it anyway. So the Pope rebutted the Unum Sanctum. And King John said, oh, oh, oh. I don't want to be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Because remember, the Catholic Church then <coughs> owned all of Europe, England, everything. So King John said, well, please let me back into the cult uh, religion. <laughs> and the Pope said, yes, I'll let you back in on condition that you pay me all of the fealty rates, all of the police fees and everything like that. King John said, yes, I'll do that. Now, one of the terms of that contract was that if King John doesn't pay the payments, the Crown of England goes to the Vatican forever. All heirs, all successors, the Crown of England goes to the Vatican. Now, King John didn't pay his rates. So guess what happened? The Crown of England went to the Vatican and it's been owned by the Vatican ever since. <coughs> now just recently we had Charlie getting crowned and he was crowned with the St Edward's crown, which is a Catholic crown. By the time he walked out of the church, they replaced that with the Imperial crown. And a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, that so means that's, that's the people's crown, it's the Imperial crown. Both of them are owned by the Vatican. Vatican couldn't lose on them. If you look at, uh, they've had this just recently where they had the, what was it, the Order of the Garter celebration? Yeah. Can I see that? Yeah. They wear the big cloak, yeah. the big hat with the ostrich feather and this big mat. The Order of the Garter is one of the highest um, orders in the Catholic Church. So they're par parading in front of you all the time, Catholic, 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 Catholic. Everything goes back to the Vatican because the royals rent the crown from the bank. Now, while we're going into that, <coughs> some people talk about, you've got to call yourself the crown. Has anyone heard that before, the terminology? The crown, that's what you refer to yourself. What's the crown? People, ah, the top of your head. That's what people say, it's the crown. So where do caesarean babies fit in? Where do breech babies fit in? They can't, because there's no crown. The crown's supposed to be what first emerges. So it doesn't. It's part of the reason. Guess what the crown is? Didn't we just talk about the crown? The crown's owned by the church. There is, who's seen a, a copy of this, the, what's called the Australian flag? What's, what's in the top left hand corner here? 
Union Jack, which is the English Latin, right? So let's just now say that we're looking at a Union Jack here. Uh, this Union Jack is made up of three flags, correct? Flag of Scotland, flag of Ireland, flag of England. Who knows what the big red one in the middle is? The St George flag? We think it's the short George flag. We've been told it's the St George flag, the flag of England. Yeah. Guess what it is really? City of Hong Crown Corporation. Which is the City of London. And the City of London is one of, well, I'll say three, people, three cities in the world that belong to the cabal. Is it the Scottish flag? <laughs> City of London, Washington DC, and the Vatican are the three cities in the world that the cabal operate out of. Crown Corporation. So what controls the Union Jack? What controls <coughs> British Isles? What controls Australia? Trials, New Zealand, the Crown Corporation, which comes back to the Vatican. Who's had a speeding fine and a letter from the government? Da, da, what's in the top left hand corner? Some sort of logo? Yeah. You know, it's the logo for the police and everything and get all the stuff and everything upside down. Why is it in the top left hand corner? <coughs> It's the first thing because we read left to right, top to bottom, everything that follows this comes under its jurisdiction. Guess what I have in the top left hand corner of every document I sent to them? My flat. I have my own personal flat. Because I'm a super and B. It's a name you may not have heard of. S U V apostrophe E R A N. Who's not heard of that term? <coughs> oh, quite a few of you. Have you heard of the one sovereign? Okay. A sovereign B is the head of a group of people. Okay. They're usually elected or appointed or something like that. That's a sovereign B. A sovereign being is the head no matter what. I'm a sovereign being. I'm not answerable to anyone. I don't have any slaves. I don't have any serfs. I'm a sovereign being in my own right. So I have my own flag. It happens to be based on the Eureka flag, which I think is appropriate for this land because the Eureka flag is all about rebellion against governments. In the middle of it, I've got a coat of arms that represents my family lineage. At the top of it, I have the words, um, I have, um, Fiat Justiae, Justitia, Ruit Caelum, which in Latin means heaven, uh, justice is in heaven. Now the reason I have that is because that's me doing this to their system. But each and every one of you, I would suggest, you are only answerable to your Creator. Doesn't matter what you call it, whether you call it God, or Allah, Krishna, or Bob. You're only answerable to your Creator as a soul. I recognize it. Most of you didn't recognize it until I told you what it was. Do you want to recognize it now? That's how easy it is, guys. You just need to read the puzzle below. It's in the dictionary. So it must be. Alright. Let's get back to this boon and sanctum. Because this is what the, the Vatican, the Pope, did. And I always have trouble remembering which Pope it was. Um, it was Pope Bonaparte the Eighth. Thank you. This is what he did. He made a papal bull. And he said, I claim every soul on the planet for the Catholic Church. Who's rebutted the Unisanctum? No. Oh. Oh, okay. 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven people in this room whose soul is not owned by the Catholic Church. How does that make the rest of you feel? Eight. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, but, but how can they do that? Well, he posted the paper ball. Who's heard of what are called maxims of law? Okay, maxims of law are like they're the cornerstones of, of law, as in L-O-R-E, not the other law. We'll get to that in a second. So under a maximum of law, it says this, he who does not deny admits. It's a maximum of law. He who does not deny admits. So if they claim your soul and you don't deny it, you've admitted it. Would this applies to somebody in the Catholic Church here? <laughs> well, we don't know. Did we agree on that uh, Case history is the case history. And it's a great one because it can work in our favour. When we start sending documents to them using their principles, that if you don't deny what I'm saying, you've admitted what I'm saying. See, I'm not about fighting their system. A lot of people are. I love their system. Well, their system's great if you're doing trade or commerce and you've got a contract with somebody. If that person breaks the contract, thank you very much. Works to our advantage. Contracts work to our advantage. Don't sign any contract that you haven't created. If someone, you know, buying a house, buying a car, doing whatever, they have to see you just sign all of this. No. Never sign someone else's contract. Create your own. Even if you're going to copy it down, but you'll make changes to it because there's lots of deceptions within it. And that's what we need to do. So never, ever, ever sign anybody else's contract. Make sure it's yours. All right, so we've got this Unum Sanctum thing going on there. And we have to learn to rebut. We've got an affidavit for you. Done all the work. We've created the affidavit. All you've got to do is fill in the details. Print it out, and then there's a list of people to send it to. Your why do we do an affidavit? Okay. We would call it, we would call it a statement and declaration of truth. That's what we would call it in the living man and woman room. In their system, it's called an affidavit. You know what I just, notice what I just did then? I've got quote marks around the word affidavit. Why did I do that? It's their word. Because it's their word, not mine. If I don't do this, I've actually agreed to their jurisdiction by calling it an affidavit. Now the reason that this affidavit is so important is because in the world of commerce and trade, the most powerful document is the unrebutted affidavit. It becomes the contract between you and whoever you send it to. Here's the other thing your affidavit does. Do you know that if you don't have this affidavit in their system, you don't exist in their system at all? Because their system can't deal with the living man and the woman. Well then how do they have all of this control over us? Because they put your name in capital letters. Your fiction exists in their system. This is how they control you, through the fiction. Okay? So, we know about the Unum Sanctum. We know we have to rebut that. That's how they've created this. But how do they go into the actual fraud? How does that happen? And that happens through a little something called the birth certificate. Now, how do they achieve this thing? How many people have heard that the birth certificate is fraudulent and illegal? Guess what? You're all wrong. Totally legal and legitimate. Your parents I'm going to show you why it's legitimate. 
when you're in your mum's room and on a terrible drawer of doing babies, whatever, let's just say that's a baby, here's the calling, and here's the placenta. You can see why I didn't become an artist. <laughs> the only artist I've got is uh, two letters. Artist. <laughs> Alright, so when you're in the womb, you are all the one DNA. Out here is mum's DNA. Your dad's was from somewhere over here, hopefully. And they come together, and everything that surrounds this is the mother's DNA. But everything that's inside of it is a combination of the two DNAs. Right? So it's a totally different property. Now, what comes the time to be born? Bub gets born. Bub out here. Bub's born. What does mum do? Uh, isn't the first thing that usually she goes, oh. yeah. <laughs> okay. Doesn't she give Bub a name? You waited six weeks? Waited two months? <laughs> Let's say that she does. <laughs> At some point she gives her Mary Jane. She doesn't give her a surname. Think about it. Just give her this beautiful, oh, my beautiful baby, I'm going to call her Mary Jane. No, my beautiful baby, I'm going to call her Mary Jane Smith. <laughs> so, mum names. Baby. Now, where does this whole idea about naming come from? Well, there's a hint in the Bible. If you want to believe the Bible is absolutely true, you're quite welcome to do that. I don't have to see it that way, but I do see the threads of truth. Adam was given dominion over all living things on the planet by doing what? Naming them. So if you name something, you get dominion over it. ownership over it. So mum owns the baby. So what happens next? The baby is the cutting of the umbilical cord. That's called severance. Severance. Remember, this is a property. When you divide a property by severance, you automatically create a trust account. Okay. There's a trust account being created. Who has the trust of the baby? The mum. Now what happens to Bob? Okay. Of course we cut. What is, not all of the wise staff are all running around like chops with their heads cut off. What happens to Bob? Wait. Why is Bob Wade? Why have they waited? Because the baby is worth its waiting. Oh. This 
automatically closes off all the blood vessels. It's called the lotus bird. If anyone's got someone who's planning on having a baby or whatever, let me know. I'll send you a fantastic book on this whole process. It's called In the Womb of the Goddess. So, the placenta's birthed. What happens to the placenta? Well, they can't do that yet. In 99.9999% of cases, what does the mother do with the placenta? Discards it, or what we would call abandons. It abandons. Guess what the clever state does? They don't take it, they salvage it under maritime law. They salvage it under maritime law. And they weigh it. Why do they weigh it? Gold. And then what do they do with it? They name it. Because if you name it, you have dominion over it. And here's what they name it. Mary Jane Smith. All totally legal and legitimate. Now, when the placenta's birthed, is it living? Yes. Is it breathing? Don't we constitute something has to be breathing to be living? Okay, and if there's no pulse and it's not breathing, what sort of birth is it? It's a stillbirth. Now, if you go into their legislation, all of their legislation, the definition of birth is includes stillbirth. Birth includes stillbirth. Now, we go back to another one of those maxims. And it's a maxim that says this. Inclusio uh, unius est. Exclusio uh, alterius. And this is what it means. Only what is included is meant, not, and it excludes everything else. Okay? For example, Australia includes North Island. What does that tell you? Australia is. Australia is Norfolk Island. So, if it includes stillbirth, not life birth, it doesn't say includes stillbirth and life birth. Birth only means stillbirth. So they're talking about your placenta. You can say that birth includes stillbirth means that's all it is stillbirth so they create this beautiful little birth certificate for the placenta with the name mary jane smith but you know what they're, they're cleverer than that i mean that's pretty clever you got to think and that's not against the law but you can claim your placenta well you can yeah uh, so look now we've got here we've got Mary Jane Smith. Now, how many of you have been told that that's in all the lower cases? That's not the fiction. If it's got the surname, it's the fiction. Because remember the other one, she was Mary Jane, comma, of the family Smith. Okay, this is Mary Jane Smith, all the one name. So it doesn't matter if it's in lowercase or not, if the surname is there, and what does surname mean? Sur, in French or old Latin means on. A surname is a name that's been put on, it's been added. That's why they ask for your surname. If you fill out a form and you put that in, you've just admitted that you're the fiction. I always cross that 
Yep. Absolutely. You go through, you put anything that's in capital letters, put a big red circle around it, dial back the criminal accountability. Every time they use capital letters. If they use your name in capital letters, put a circle around that and put not living entity fiction. What about just the title like the news? Even just the title. Whatever the document, this is where a lot of people who are doing the work that we're doing make simple mistakes. They'll put the, at the top of the page, they'll put notice of infringement. infringement. If you've put that at the top of your document, guess what? You've made the whole document. Or criminal account of it. So do they have to take any notice on it? We've got to make our documents bulletproof. Little things like don't use capital letters. If you do, you have to put quote marks against it because you're quoting them. So the name, the names. To all of my documents, these to the living man or woman known as and then quotes exactly as how he puts it. John Jones. No, you write it exactly as he writes it. If he writes it all in lowercase, you write it in lowercase. That's replying to... That's replying to anyone. You put their name exactly how they have it and you are consistent through the whole letter. You don't write anything. To the living man. See, I'm not talking to the fiction. I'm not talking to the CEO of the company. I'm talking to the living man who acts. Yes, I'm making that the living man. Well, if you've removed it off the page, how does that help you? No, you, you want to know who you're sending it to. So that means you'd be sending. If you did this. To the living man known as John. How many Johns have we got in the room? <laughs> Which one are we sending to? We don't know. Could be any one of them. The only things that I do is I put down at the bottom big in quotes and a postcode. Because I don't recognise those things. That's part of the military system. I don't recognise the state and I don't recognise postcodes. So mine is to the living man known as, quote, John Jones, acting as whatever he calls himself, CEO, in quote marks, whatever the company name is, in quote marks. Then I put their street address. Then the town known as. Brunswick. Because can I prove Brunswick exists? If I can't prove something that exists, I don't put it on a piece of paper. How can I prove Brunswick exists? It doesn't. Brunswick only exists on a piece of paper. That's where the states exist. States only exist on pieces of paper. They don't exist on the land. So the town known as Brunswick, land of Terra Australis. If you put Australia down there, guess what you've just done? you just consent it to their jurisdiction. I don't recognise this land as Terra Australis. I know from their legislation that Australia is Norfolk Island, the Kilos Islands and Christmas Island. Isn't it interesting that when all the boat people were trying to get here to this land, they had to stop them before they set foot on the land. Because if they set foot on the land, there was nothing they could do. They had to stop them before they got here, and they took them back to Christmas Island, back to Australia, where they have jurisdiction over them. Now, the other thing at the top of my letter, so you know at the top of my letter I've got uh, my flag in the top left hand corner. Now, the other thing, sorry. You can, everything that I've got here, you can access through the People's Court of Terra Australis.org. We've got Thursday nights, we have Zoom calls, 
We answer your questions. There's a huge manual of questions that have been asked before. You can go through that and then you can come on and you can ask us another question and we can help you through the process. So I've got my flag here, so that's my jurisdiction. And I've got my title to my document in lower case over here. What do I put over here? What do I put under it? And what's the content in my next three questions? This is what I put over here. I put the logo of my court. See, I'm a super being. I'm only answerable to my creator. I can create my own court. I have a right to do that. And my court can pass judgments on things. You should see the face when I put a judgment from my court into their court. Say, so, sorry, this matter's already been determined by a higher court. It's been dismissed. What's this, what's this moot court of Terra Australis? I said, well, that's a higher court than this court. It's a court of living people. That's this. Well, I don't recognise that. I said, thank you very much. Under equity of law, I don't have to recognise your court. Thank you. Good afternoon. They have to. They also have to accept the rulings of other courts. It says it in their own guidelines. They must accept the rulings of other courts. Which means it doesn't say where those courts come from. They have to accept the ruling. They can't dismiss it. They have to say to the prosecution, oh, sorry, you have to go back to that court and challenge it in that court <laughs> before a jury of 12 living men and women. Where is that? It's in the Magistrates Court bench book. Um, several other places where it says that they have, courts must abide by the rulings of other courts. Might be the Courts Act as well. Um, well, this is the, th the fun part. You, you serve the documents <coughs> ahead of time, and with the documents comes your remedy. Saying if they do this, if they do that, they have to pay your remedy. And so your schedule of fees is like a million dollars of trespass. I'm waiting for the cops to come to me. My door. <laughs> They called me 7, 7.30 in the morning. I mean, I know some people get up early. The cops rang me 7.30 Sunday morning to say there's a, a notice of an application for a, a, a variation of a, an order. And they wanted me to go around to the police station so they could give it to me. <laughs> or they were going to come to me. Now, the interesting thing is, I actually went around to the police station. Not, not this time, did previously, on the same matter. And I handed over the birth certificate. I said, I'm surrendering the person whose name is on the warrant. He said, is that you? I said, no, I'm a living man. <laughs> I'm surrendering the person. There it is. That's the person created by the state. Tom had no idea what was going on. <laughs> Walks out the back, comes back again, says, well, you know, if you're not the person, then you know, we can't do anything for you. I said, but you've got the person there. He said, well, yeah, I'm going to keep this. I said, so you've taken the person into custody. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, it's fun. It's fun. You should see their faces. Well, the, the best one was when they arrested me the other day. And see, I, I laugh about it because these guys haven't got a clue what they're doing. They burst in through the door and they what are you doing? I surrender order to combat. And they're still doing it. I said, did you hear me? And the sergeant steps forward and he says, what, what do you mean? I said, you don't know what surrender order combat means, do you? He said, no. I said, you need to do some research because you're in big trouble. <laughs> mm. Surrender or the combat, for those of you who don't know. H O R S D E C O M B C O M B or the combat. It means I'm not fighting you. I'm just surrendering because we're under martial law. Because we're being invaded by a foreign corporation. Our land is under martial law. Martial law applies. Okay. So <laughs> the sergeant sort of says, oh, just calm down, boys, calm down, boys. And eventually, he, the cop was arresting me, starts you know, citing my rights to me. And I said, are you sure you got those completely right, mate? Because I had all these unalienable rights before you even came in the door. You're not giving me these rights. I automatically have them, and I haven't surrendered them. Says to the other constable, reading his rights. 
So the constable standing in front of me, and he starts going, you have the right to remain silent, you have to do that. And I said, don't. He said, do you understand those as I've just read them to you? I said, no, I don't understand. I said, why not? I said, well, for starters, you didn't read them to me. And it says you must read me my rights, not recite them. <laughs> okay. I was having fun. I could have waited to any time later to say my rights were not read to me. They have to be read to you. That's what the legislation says. Okay. They, they all had their cameras on, and I insisted they did. I said, can you all make sure you've got your cameras on? Because I want to subpoena all of this, the evidence. So after that talk, I'm holding my hands up and showing all the marks on my wrists to the guy's chest. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just recording the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> so then I start asking them loaded questions. Are you an officer of the capital letter Victoria Police? He says, yes. I said, thank you very much. I was, cross I was giving a guy some clues on how to cross-examine when the case is coming up as a policeman. I said, you asked the cop this. Did you take an oath as a constable? What are they going to say? Yes. yes. Please recite that oath. <coughs> if they can't recite the oath, then how do they know they were acting under it? So you go through that process. Well, if you can't recite it, how do we know that you were acting under it? Here's where the next bit comes. Did you also take an oath as an officer of the capital letter Victorian Police, the lower case Victoria Police is a different thing to the capital letter Victoria Police. Okay. What's the difference? The Victoria Police lower case, which the Victoria Police Act establishes, is they act as members of the community, and the only authority that they have is if there's a crime being committed or if you disturb the peace. That's it for a constable. An officer is a member of a private organisation, a militarised organisation. So then the next question, he says, um, yes, so what, can you recite that oath? No. How can you go out and perform your duties if you don't know what your oath is? And the next question, in which capacity did you arrest the man? Did you arrest him as a constable or did you arrest him as an officer? See what we do? We're undermining their authority all the way through. All right. So, all right. So I've got my court. I've established my court. You can go to um, ATSI and you can pay $39 register your name. Mine's the Moot Court of Terra Australis. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Straw Court. You go to ATSI. Yeah. You register the name of a court you want to call your court. Here it would be the Court of Mary Jane Smith. Or the Court of Mary Jane. Or whatever you want to call it. It's your court. Because guess what? No, it's every three years. It's 39 bucks. That's worth it. And the reason I did it was simply this. I knew that the Capital Letter <coughs> Magistrates Court was a trading name of the Department of Justice. So my court has exactly the same legal standing as theirs. It's a trading name of the private Limited Company. Therefore, we come under the same rules. That's why I did it. The other reason, the other thing I did, which I had a lot of fun with, I don't know if you've heard you can uh, purchase land in Scotland, like a little square oh, yeah. foot of land, and you get the title of Lord or Lady. Yeah. <laughs> so I purchased that. When I went to court, they said, well, you know, what do you want to be called? I said, well, you can call me your Lordship. <laughs> you can call me Ambassador. Or you can call me by the given name. Well, I think we'll be calling you by the given name, because they don't want to put you in any position of authority. That's why you can have so much fun with it. Uh, are they bastards? Absolutely they are. Oh, can't get, can't get me out fast enough. Yeah, you do there, Brian, I know. But here's the thing. 
if you push their buttons and they start to go, oh, God, I'm not putting up with any of this nonsense. You see, your honour seems to be emotionally compromised and incapable of hearing this matter. <laughs> and once you've said it, he has to. Because you've called him out on it. So I've got my court here, over there. Now, under here, I have written the date known as, and then quotes. Why do I, why do I have it as the date known as? Who invented the calendar? Can't prove it. It's their system. They, they put it in. The Julian calendar got put in place by them. So if you acknowledge their calendar, what have you done? You agree that you're under their jurisdiction. I only operate in the now. And there's, there's, there's times I can't even remember what day it is. I do remember my name. No, I don't use PO Box. I just use Care Of. Care of an address. You don't put an actual address ever. You always put care of then the address. And then what address? What? Yeah. Does the address need to be associated with someone or with you or with? Sure, of course. You can put any address you want. So long as you can get documents through that. That's that yep. If your name says you, I'm happy to to take any documents that come addressed to your court. But don't put it without the care of I know uh, some guys who, instead of a post office box, they put whatever the number of their box is and then a slash and then the address of the post office. So it looks like it's a normal address. But if you put a post office box, you're coming in under their jurisdiction. So, the date known as, alright, we'll put that there. Now, what size paper am I doing this on? Bulls cap. cap. Well, that's just me. You don't have to use Bulls cap. Not A4. Not A4 paper. Where do you get it from? Bulls cap, you can get it anywhere, but the simple thing I do is I go down to the office works and ask them to cut A3 paper down to Bulls cap size. They go, shoo, shoo, and they get some nice off cuts for the shop. Bulls <laughs> cap is uh, around about 8 inches by 13. Yeah, you can, you can use your own size. It doesn't have to be full scale. I just like it because it's longer than the A4 and stuff's their whole filing system. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can always use A4. Because it's copyrighted. It's all, all this stuff is all copyrighted by their system. By the so don't use A4 paper. What font do we mostly do stuff in? Think about what's the default on all computers. Times New Roman. Guess who owns Times New Roman? They do. They also come with a lot of Personally, I, I like basketball. I, I just like it. So I use basketball. What size font do I use? Not 12 font. I don't use 12 font because guess who has copyright on 12 font? So what do I do? Do you think I make it bigger or smaller? Yeah. I make it smaller. It's harder to read. And also, I don't have to use as many pages that way either. So usually 11.5. What colour do I print stuff in? Blue is corporate. My corporation? Red is the leading man. Purple. Purple. Why do I use purple? Because I'm a super being. And purple is my colour. That's my ruling colour. You'll also find on the documents things in italics. Who knows what italics is? Yeah? Swearing. It's cursive. So if anybody sends you a document that's in italics, you circle, you circle it and you go, Yeah, no swearing. You read the sign. You're in dishonour because you've, you've sworn them on a piece of paper. So purple. They have to. Oh look, I said.
set documents back to them with all these red marks all over them, saying, if you please, if you want to correspond, please send a document that is in English and only in English, because this is not understood. That's the courts, that's the police. Can you imagine everyone? <laughs> Absolutely, and they take it and say, oh, don't worry about it, just ignore it. <laughs> Sorry. The EU does not accept denial. So if they, accept, if they don't accept my document and they're trying to deny it, they have to prove why. And it's not understood. Uh, sorry, can I just clarify, at uh, times you run any other than that? No, I never use my truck. No. Oh, no. Just, just the, pick one that you like. I mean, there's some really funny ones that you can do. Um, Comic Sans and all of that. Aerial if you want, but just stay away from those ones. Um, and also, when you're doing, if you're using full scale paper, make sure that you leave enough space at the bottom so that the whole thing can be scanned onto A4. Because you're going to send, you're going to keep the original. You never send your original documents. You keep your originals at all times. Then you scan it onto A4 and send it to them in black. These ones can be photocopied. Normally, if I've got a long document that's got colour stuff in my flag, I'll print the first page in colour and then all the rest in black and white, back to back. Never send them single-sided documents because the document continues onto that empty side and they can put it on whatever they want. So once you, you can make yours out single-sided, that's fine because it's yours. But when you're copying it, and then making it up as a PDF or whatever, double side the pages. Always. All right, so we've covered a little bit of how the fraud was first instigated, how they've done it through the birth certificate, and how we start to address the claims that are being made against the fiction. Now, the whole objective here is not to win your case. The objective is to get them to withdraw rather than expose the fraud. Okay, so all the documents that we have for you are designed to expose them into the fraud. So you'll probably set up with, well, let's take one of these. A, um, how about council rates? Let's do council rates. Um, before you finish up the paper layout, do you have a number, page number, You can do that if you want. If you double sided, you don't. Care. But normally, as a course of doing it, I would number the pages. The last page is the Yes. So there's no page in the Yeah, if you've got the last page in blank, you can see put a line from top left to bottom right, and that's striking through. And ideally, you want to just push it along with that as well. So let's get down to uh, how do we, for one of the good words, sign off on a document? Why writing it in a book and taking a copy and sending it in black? Because it's part of the trick. Because in their realm, they only read the dead language. But I've got the original. So anything that they want to challenge, they have to come to me. Because it costs money to print it out in colour. The hell with they don't, they don't take any notice of the colour anyway. So we might as well give it to them in black. Because the only thing that matters is the five copy and that's in colour. So if it goes to court, then they're never going to challenge the document. And then the eight forward, um, saying they have a copyright, No, because I've got the original. They just got a copy of the original. When it comes to court proceedings, the only document that has any value is the original. Um, signing off. Okay. Once you've done the affidavit, this will make sense. I am a soul, and I choose the name for my soul, not my mother. Okay. And this, that name is Alice. That's my soul's name. So the first thing I do is purple is I put Alex. Then I pick up my red pen. This one I put And 
and through it, I put the given names that my mother gave to the living body. Appellation 
not named. Appellation is something by which you are called, not something by which you are owned. Perfect on. Now, from that moment on, if the prosecution or the judge refers to me as Mr. Substitute your own name there, Mr. Alexander or Miss Smith, I can call them up straight away on Barratry. Barratry. Barratry is when you commit her speech, when you take a living man or woman and you turn them into fiction. So at that point, I can get the whole matter dismissed because they're clearly trying to force me to another jurisdiction. So do you say, oh, excuse me, I say, objection, Your Honour. Prosecution have just tried to force me into another jurisdiction, and that's not me. They're referring to me as the fiction. No, I did that on the court on Friday. I said everything that I was taught, I was taught. You're not going to take the contract every time you call me Mr. I said, well, wait a moment. These are my lawfully given names. Just walk straight over the top, talk straight over the top, completely ignore everything I said. Not only did they find did they find me guilty and convict me of the crime because of committed, they gave me the maximum sentence, the maximum fine. Were you in the witness box? No. Did you declare yourself right at the beginning? Did you ask for permission to come aboard? No, I didn't ask for permission to come aboard. Well, you're a stowaway, therefore you've got no rights. Yeah. You must ask for permission to come aboard the ship. No. Yes. Request permission to come aboard, Your Honour. They, they, they bullshit said, Your Honour, I'm still, still waiting for permission to come aboard. For the third time, Your Honour, I'm waiting for permission to come aboard. They, they'll say, yes, you come aboard. But you say, no, I need you to say permission granted. I'll say permission granted. Then you come aboard. And you say, just confirming, Your Honour, that I'm now a passenger on board this ship and you have a duty of care towards me. And as the beneficiary in this case, you, as the trustee, have a fiduciary responsibility to me. I state it, bang, then and then. And here's what they should then say. Yes, very well, how would you like to proceed? Because you've defined what the, the jurisdiction is. If you don't do that, they will impose a jurisdiction. And the first one they'll try to do is to call you, are you Mr. Smith? To which you say, has your honor changed the jurisdiction of this matter? Yeah, are you changing the jurisdiction of this matter? Because all the paperwork that's been provided, there is not one single mention of a Mr. Smith on that. Okay. In that instance, if I'm not um, allowed to come on board, am I allowed to walk out of that court? You can walk out of the courtroom any time you want. I, I was standing there in one case, because see, when I go to court, I'm always testing different bits and pieces to see how they react. And in one, they had me up for driving an unregistered vehicle. And I stood there, prosecution introduced himself, judge turns to me and says, uh, are you Mr. Alexander? I said, oh, you're right, it's not for me to identify who I'm self, they're the ones who are making the claim, let them identify who I am. Oh, really? yes, well, yeah. Look, just argue Mr. Alexander. I said, no, you're right, I've just told you. They're the ones who are making the claim. If they identify me as Mr. Alexander, then we'll go from there. But I've never seen this man before in my life. He probably wouldn't know me if he walked past me in the street. But it's up to him to identify who I am, not me. Blue in the face, smoke coming out of his ears, carrying on. For the last time, are you Mr. Alexander? I said, Your Honour, I will tell you this. I am not the accused as written. At which point, the prosecution did this. Couldn't get a quick no. Jumped up out of his seat. Your Honour, since he's not the accused, I move we go ex parte. The judge said, yes, we'll go ex parte. Guess what I did? Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. And I walked out. And somebody said, well, what just happened then? I said, the prosecution and the judge both agree I'm not the accused. <laughs> <laughs> See, you can have fun in there. <laughs> well, they, they then went ex parte, but it had nothing to do with me. They couldn't then impose any fine on me, the living man, 
because they just admitted I wasn't the fiction. So they probably took the money out of the trust account. And we've got ways that we can do that as well. So they change the jurisdiction, air, land, and water, and this is how they do it. Oh, that's a good question. Whose trust account is it? How many people have been told there's millions of dollars in these trust accounts? There is because from the time that the placenta was weighed, they have traded it. They traded it backwards and forwards, the price is up. If you go and work for somebody, guess which name you're working for? The fiction. All of your work contracts are all fraudulent. Imagine when you call your employees out on that and say, excuse me, you didn't pay me, you paid a fiction. The, the whole contract was a fraud and the tax office, you gave them money that was belonging to me. Sorry, I was working here for 20 years, I've just discovered the fraud, I want all my money, thank you. And you're entitled to do it. Me, I've never worked that in my life. <laughs> Seriously, I, I have not worked for anyone since I was... 1990. Because I, I was very early on to the best thing to do is set yourself up a company and put everything through your company. Yeah. I've never paid tax since 1990. One of the things you, you can do now is you can pull up to a petrol station, fill up your petrol, carbon petrol, let's say it costs 100 bucks, go in them and offer them 70 bucks and say, there you are paying for the petrol. I'll say, no, it's it's 100 bucks. I said, no, no, it's 70 bucks plus tax. I'm a living man, I don't pay tax. If you want the tax, you need to get it out of the government. <laughs> yeah, but there's lots of fun things that you can do along the way. So trust account. Um, okay. Who set, up, who set up these trust accounts? The government. And they did it legally and lawfully, correct? Yeah, we just went through that before. Yeah, they did it totally legal and lawfully. They set up the trust accounts, and all the money is in it is their money. But here's the thing. Because when you were back in the womb, you as the baby were the beneficiary of the placenta, guess who they have to make the beneficiary of the trust accounts? You, the living man, the living woman. So you're the beneficiary of all those millions of dollars that are in there. But that, now let me play this one at you. Grandma's got three million dollars in the bank and she's left it all to me. And I say, well, Grandma, I want the money now because it's my money. And Grandma says, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> you have to declare the trust dead, i.e. the placenta dead, and instruct the treasury to dissolve the trust and pay out the beneficiaries. Then you can get the money. Well, uh, there's people who've done it. Um, people say to me, why, why haven't you done it? I said, I'm too, too busy out talking to people how to do it. Go around to it. And I don't do things for money. People think that they, it's their money and they can go and grab it. Can't. What you can do is you can instruct the Registrar General and the Treasury to pay any accounts in that name. It's called a Notice of Direction and Instruction. And they hate it. Because if they don't pay it, they're up Misfeasance and malfeasance in public office. So we've had a lot of registrar generals who have resigned because of this. What was it called? Sorry, a notice of direction. Notice of direction and instruction. This is where you take the document, the speeding fine, whatever it is, you get your red pen, you do offer accepted, payment authorised, matter set by the equity court, and then you send a copy of that with a notice of direction and instruction to the registrar general because he's the trustee of that account pay it, and you send a copy of all that to the creditor, saying, payment's been authorised, all future correspondence needs to go to the registrar general. Do you have some sort of information or instructions on that? Because I've got three clients that I just got, and I don't know. Come along on Thursday night. I think it's called terrestrialist.org. It's every Thursday night, and there's a huge manual. 7.30, there's a huge manual of speeding fines, parking fines, there's so many different ways that you can skin the cat. You know what the first thing when they send you the envelope? And it's in the name of the fiction. You've got so many different options. 
of what you want to do. If you think you know what it is, just simply put, return to sender, yeah. um, deceased estate uh, addressee not recognised as being at this tri registrar general care of Lost Star Street. Um, there's lots of different ways you can do it. If you want to open it, I'll open it. Where do we go from there? Right. You need to provide a simple document from yourself to yourself that you, as the beneficiary of the trust account, i.e., the living woman Mary, uh, acting as beneficiary of this capital lettered Mary trust account, authorise the living woman <coughs> Mary, lowercase, to open any mail addressed to the capital letter Mary <laughs> without any legal liability incorporated. So you're only there to open the mail for picture. That means you can't be done up for mail fraud. Because okay. every time you open one of these letters with a fiction name, you're committing mail fraud. I know, stop doing it. <laughs> oh. Sorry, here is a grandma. Can you still... Um, yeah. There's a guy called Daniel Luke, and he actually sent a letter saying that the fiction had committed suicide. <laughs> and he, he's, there was a notification of death. The so, look, you can have so much fun with this once you get into it. Yes. Can I just ask, if you get on the spot fine, so you don't get them sent, so I had an on spot, you know, you pulled over, and he's given it to me then and there. What do I do in that? Usually I want to do that, but I'm just going to do Well, look, there's, there's a whole way to handle things when you get pulled over. Okay, the first thing you do is you wind your window down that much and you lock all the doors. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can do that. The, the first thing you do is you say, uh, what is the emergency officer and how can I help you? And they'll say, there is no emergency. Oh. So you deceptively used emergency lights for the purpose of pulling me over to try to contract me. Is that correct? Because that's what they're doing. So there's a whole process, and we can show you this process and how to deal with it. It doesn't mean they're still not going to try to arrest you and do all of that. But once you've got your affidavit and your schedule of fees in place, every time they threaten to arrest you, it's $1,000. So what I do is I string it all out for as long as I can. I get the guy, because they also have to pay $500 a minute for an unlawful so I go, right, you're on my time now, boys. So I string it out. Threat to arrest, that's number one, that's 1,000. Two, three, four, five, six. Six threats to arrest. And then when they're about to bash the window in, I said, I need to speak to a superior officer. I have to get one. And it'll take 10 to 15 minutes for that guy to come in the car, and I'm getting paid 500 bucks a minute, so I don't care. And then I go through the same process all over again with the superior officer. And then at the point where they're about to brush it down again, I say, I surrender all the combat. Because I'm just making money. So uh, because they've got no authority. Have you actually been paid this? What has actually happened? Oh, I've got probably a dozen of these things <laughs> going on and uh, invoices. They're all in the process. I've got uh, six cops from. 2019, and the invoices are now up to around about $70 billion each. <laughs> okay. It's a long game. And it's one of the things I'm going to do this year is I'm starting to call these in now. Because with a commercial link process, you do the first invoice, you do a reminder notice, then a final notice, which is a notice of action. Then you instigate the commercial link. Once the commercial link's in place, they can't get out of it. Once the commercial Once the commercial link is in place, they can't get out of it. Okay. I'm in the long game. That's why I say I don't go into court to get a win. Because I've got bigger fish to fry. I'm trying to get them up on fraud and all the other things. So I'm in there gathering evidence. That's what I do. So I asked, um, I asked one particular judge. Uh, I said, so if there's a conflict between the law of God and the law of this court, which is the superior one? Guess what he said? This court. And I said, uh, and why is that? He said, because I'm employed by this court. <laughs> I went, well, thank you very much. You want that one now? <laughs> he got the invoice for three million dollars the next day. So there's many different ways, and sometimes you can apply several of them at once. 
But most of us are at the grassroots level. So the best thing to do is start to plug into people who are talking this all the time. And even just by osmosis, I mean, how, how much do you think you've learned today just out of the simple stuff? Because it doesn't get any harder than this. Once you get this, everything after that is simple. Because it's, I mean, I've just got to file the right paperwork and say that what I think, yes. So I just want to finish this off before we have a little bit of break. Land, air and water are the different variations of the name. So you might have in capital letters Smith, Mary Jane. There might be capital letters Mary Jane Smith. And then there's, there's also Mr. Mrs. These different variations relate to these different trust accounts. So if you've got something from the police that has two different variations of the name, you say, which jurisdiction are you making a claim under? Because you've got two accused names here. In one of my cases, I had 11. <laughs> the defendant, the accused, the respondent, and then all of these other variations of my name. I said, the prosecution don't even know who they're making claim against unless they can provide a document that ties all these names in together as one. And here's where the police fall down. They have to, or they will provide what's called a leak document. And in that leak document, it will have the name of the fiction and under it, it will have aliases. There's no other aliases listed. So anything that's in the document that's not under that name gets struck out straight away. What if you're in down? Say that. Lip, L-E-A-K. All right, let's have a bit of a break so we can stretch our legs. Lip glass in the water. <laughs>